the National Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. We'd all been celebrating in the afternoon that London had won the Olympic bid and we just thought it was a good excuse to go out and have a few drinks, really, to celebrate. The following morning, my alarm went off. Um, and I am usually very good in the morning. I'm quite a morning person. Uh, that morning, I decided to have 10 minutes more in bed. Those 10 minutes would come at a price. On July the 7th, 2005, Martin Wright was just another passenger on the London Underground until she sat next to a suicide bomber. I just had a white flash in front of my eyes and I felt like I was being thrown from side to side and I remember consciously thinking, what the hell is going on? Today, the chilling sound the lives of hundreds of totally innocent vehicles the bomb shattered, shattered the name of the how to devastated terrified. carriages, no. killing and maiming. Suddenly, it was just black devastation, you know, it just blackness. I don't remember the pain, I just do not remember any pain. Um, all I could see was sort of metal going down into me. I didn't realise that my legs were, were caught up in it and there was just an electrical sort of burning smell and it was getting a little quieter and quieter as well and, and I can only really equate that to in, in the beginning if people were dying and things. I could see this figure coming down towards the door that had been blown off um, and this was Liz, Liz Kenworthy, the off-duty policewoman. Um, and basically this was the, the lady that saved my life. She... No, it's all right, it's all right. It's just, I just think I'm so lucky. Just so lucky. But, um, she... She came through. And I, I can't imagine again what she was faced with but because you know i was there and she and she saw the state of my legs and uh i remember seeing her and i just kept saying to her my name's martine wright please tell my mum and dad i'm okay my name's martine wright on 7 7 2005 martine wright began a quite extraordinary journey her very personal story is inseparable from london's public preparations for the games by 2007 as London's often embattled organisers were bruised by budget issues and battered by a hostile response to the game's logo, Martine began to reveal her irrepressible spirit, learning to ski and fly. Then, in May 2008, as Boris Johnson became Mayor of London, the Beijing Games provided Martine a map for her own journey. I knew that I had to do something as a result of losing my legs that day, otherwise, to me, it would have been all a complete waste of time. So I was actually looking at the Paralympics in a very new light, in a, in a light of a disabled person, and uh, looking at it and thinking, my God, wouldn't it be amazing to do something like that? So I started playing for a sitting volleyball club. And what I did enjoy about it is that you're not in your chair, you know, you, you, you move on, on the floor. It's a very dynamic game, very fast game. I came into politics in 2010, Britain elected its youngest Prime Minister in nearly 200 years. With little experience herself, Martine tried out for the first GB sitting volleyball team. She was selected to play in the World Championships. In a chilling coincidence, they travelled to the tournament in the USA on July the 7th. That's when I sort of realised, oh my God, I could be on such a special journey on, on, you know, I could actually end up at the Paralympics. As the mood turned raw during the riots of 2011, it was a tense time for Martine and her teammates, who still had to persuade the British Paralympic Association 
they were good enough to appear at the games. The news they dreamed of finally came in March 2012. I just think back and I actually can't believe the journey that has happened and is happening now that I'm on. Um, you know, maybe I was always meant to get up late that morning. Maybe I was always meant to run up the escalator and jump on that carriage that I got on. You know, maybe I was always meant to do this journey. I don't know, I can't, I can't answer that. All I can say is that I'm just lucky to be living this dream now. Well, morning, everyone. You're definitely sufficiently warmed up, I feel. Uh, the choir did a great job, but don't worry, I'm not gonna make you sing a, sing a song, although you did do very well. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and let me start by saying thank you for inviting me in, but you know what? It's an absolute honour to be asked here today, to be surrounded by healthcare professionals that make huge differences to people's lives every minute of every day you go to work. As you've heard from the video, my name is Martine Wright, and I'm proud to say that I'm now captain of the Great Britain sitting volleyball team. And I did actually have the huge honour of taking part in the London Paralympics. Um, actually, within this building here, within the XL, so, so this, this building has got very special memories for me. Um, and that was a dream that I was working towards over the last few years, but that hasn't always been my dream. Um, and as, as you heard from the film, 10 years ago now, I can't quite believe it is 10 years ago, but 10 years ago, I was on the way to work as an international marketing manager, and I stepped on a circle line tube in London, and it changed my life forever. I was sat just four foot away from one of the suicide bombers that decided to hit London that morning. I was actually the last to be rescued from the circle line train. I was, I was down there for about an hour and 15 minutes, um, something that I, I still can't comprehend. But my family frantically searched for me for nearly two days. Again, something that I can't quite get my head around. But they finally found me at the Royal London Hospital, completely unrecognizable. I'd lost both my legs above the knee. I'd lost 80% of my blood, been resuscitated several times, and was in a deep coma. And after 10 days, I came out of this coma to look down in my hospital bed and to see that my legs were gone. I can't really describe to you how I felt at that moment, but I pretty much felt like my world had ended. I just couldn't believe that out of the millions of people that travel on the tube every day, I was the most injured survivor. It seemed so unfair. I, I often thought back then I'd probably have more chance of winning the lottery than sitting where I was sitting that day. But the medical staff and my family kept reassuring me, but I remember back then, all I, all I kept saying was, but I've got no legs, I've got no legs. And I remember this one day where, as I was saying, but I've got no legs, my, my mum, who is a fantastic woman and my inspiration, she grabbed hold of my face and she said, but Martine, you are still here. And you could have been paralyzed or you could have had a brain injury, but you didn't. So you survived, you are still Martine, and you can get new legs. And I'm sure there's people here today who have been through something equally traumatic, or obviously I know all of you in your daily working lives come across patients that have been through something like this. And I'm sure that they would tell you that there was one thing that they were faced with, and that was a turning point. My turning point came on a day when I was actually supposed to be chief bridesmaid to my best friend Alex. But instead, I was, I was strong enough at Royal London, it was about two months after, to go up to the physio for the first time. And uh, I remember looking up around this room and seeing all manner of different people. Um, I saw a, a girl who's one of my very good friends now. She'd lost both her legs and both her arms through meningitis. I met other victims of the bombings who might not have been as physically injured as me, 
but psychologically, they were completely traumatized. And this was the day that I found out how many people died that day. 52 people, innocent people, on their way to work, had been killed. And I had no idea at all before this point. So I think this was pretty much the day, well, not pretty much, this was the day that, that I sort of said to myself, Martin, pull yourself together. You got two choices. Um, either you can feel sorry for yourself for the rest of your life and keep asking that question, why me, why me, and decide never to walk again, or to think, right, well, life carries on. And, and yes, it was, a, it was an awful thing, worse than anything I could have ever imagined. But there are always people worse off than you. I didn't die that day. I had a choice, and I had a choice to live my life, whatever it may hold. I also realized I was lucky that day, not just because I survived that day and Liz Kenworthy, the off-duty policewoman, saved my life, but I was lucky because of the support I had around me. And it would be this support that played such a huge part in my recovery. So obviously that, that support was, was from my family, from my friends, but also all the emergency services, the medical staff and all the healthcare professionals that put me back together again and uh, saved my life. So whether they were top surgeons, doctors, nurses, physios, OTs, psychologists, or even back office people, office and ward managers. In fact, just like people, all of you here today, supporting patients medically, but providing so much more on an emotional and psychological level. So with this support, I decided, right, I am gonna to start to walk again. And I went off to the Douglas Barder unit in Queen, I don't know why I'm pointing that at you. I'm assuming that's going to work the slides. Yes. I went off to the Douglas Bardi unit at Queen Mary's Hospital and uh, started my rehabilitation. Um, and I, I, first of all, walked on these, what you call rockers. I'm sure there's quite a few healthcare professionals out there that have come across these. I thought my physio was completely winding me up when she showed me these, because I thought they actually looked like Douglas Bardi's legs from the 1940s. They look so archaic. Um, but they turned out to be a very good tool to walk on. And um, I'm not saying it was easy, you can probably see from my facial expression. It's, well, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But I did persevere. Um, and I finally got my C legs. C stands for computerized, not C as in I thought I was going to put them on and feel like I was walking on water or something. But C stands for computerized. And after a year in hospital, a long time, um, it was time for me to leave. And I think for me, as a patient, this was the hardest time at all, um, out of all of it. I'd, I'd been in an environment where it was completely normal <laughs> to have legs and arms missing. And now I was back to normal life, but not living in my flat in London, um, having to move in with my, with my mum in a, in a house that I couldn't even walk out of. And um, I remember this one day again, it sticks in my memory, where I just couldn't stop crying. And my sister came to me and she said, what's, what's, what's wrong? I said, all I wanna do is walk out this house and go home. All I wanna do is walk out this house and go home. And I think when you go through something traumatic, and again, obviously, with what you do every day, you come across this on a, on a daily basis. But for me, the hardest thing to deal with was the memories, the memories of how I used to do things before. You know, one day you're one person, the next day you're someone else. So I decided in order to get over these feelings, I had to make my life different. And I had to grab every opportunity I could, because I could, because again, I will always remember those people that day that didn't have that opportunity. And I also knew I had to do something as a result of losing my legs. Otherwise, I suppose to me, it would have all been in vain being, being involved in that, in that awful atrocity. So the first, first thing I did, literally, and it was literally weeks after I left hospital, I was off to South Africa to learn to fly planes. 
as you can imagine, told my mum and dad, you know, my mum literally sort of fainted on the floor. It's like, oh, you've just been in hospital for a year and you're going off to fly planes. Um, my, my husband, or my boyfriend at the time, Nick, was really worried about the prospect of me flying a plane. I've got no idea why. Although, when I do look at this photo up here, which I, it, might, it might come up again, um, I'm sure he might have been um, right, because I'm sure I'm supposed to be facing forward whilst flying a plane instead of smiling into the camera. Um, but as well as the opportunity to fly a plane completely on my own, it also gave me my strength back and my independence back, something that I'd lost when I, when I um, lost my legs. So I came back from there and again, grabbed another opportunity to, to ski again, which was absolutely amazing. But I still wasn't satisfied. So a few months after this, um, I had the opportunity to raise some, some money for charity. And I'm sure there's many of you in the audience today that have done this. Yes, I decided to jump out of a plane. This was not a popular choice for my mum and dad. I mean, literally, it was, you cannot put us through any more. Um, but obviously, I did. Uh, went up to 10,000 foot, jumped. One of the most scariest things I've ever done in my life, but absolutely brilliant. And interestingly enough, my family said they heard me before I appeared through the clouds. <laughs> which apparently was a first for my instructor. Um, so, you know, well, more recently as well, again, within this building here, the XL, uh, I had the huge honor of being awarded the, the Helen Rollison Award at, at BBC Sports Personality of the Year. And then... <laughs> that was an amazing night. Um, and then, uh, more recently, one of the huge highlights, and the ladies might be slightly more impressed with this than the men, I don't know, but um, I took part in Sport Relief Strictly. And uh, to be able to dance again was, 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 was huge for me, but also uh, it wasn't too bad being swung round by the lovely Ian Waite for a few weeks training. Uh, so, you know, things, things aren't always bad. Um, so we all know that bad things do sometimes happen and we've got no control over certain things in life. But what I've learned over the last 10 years is that good can come out of bad. And all these things I've done, I would never have done if it weren't for going through the most traumatic time of my life. And we know life isn't fair sometimes. And again, I don't need to tell you this because you guys must see this on a daily basis. Illness affecting the nicest of people, or people dying young before their time, or families just having to deal with huge life-changing occurrences. But we do have two choices. And I'm not saying it happens overnight, but we do have two choices. We can you know, either feel sorry for ourselves, or we can get up and say, no, I'm not standing for this, and be determined to get something positive out of it. I believe anything is possible as long as you believe. I think what is forgotten sometimes, and again, you guys, I imagine this is you know, in the forefront of your mind a lot of the time, is when, when something like this happens, it doesn't just happen to the individual, it happens to everyone around you. So there have been positives for me, but also positives for my family and my friends as well. So for instance, my husband realized life was too short as a result of what happened. And he uh, followed his dream of running his own photography business. My family discovered a strength in each other that we would never have found if it weren't for going through the most traumatic time of our lives. And my nephew, well, he could not believe his luck when I took him to Euro Disney and he realized he didn't have to queue up for any of the rides because <laughs> I'm in a wheelchair. So. Again, that's, that, that's favourite auntie material. You cannot beat that one for favourite auntie material. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, it's not, it's not all that bad. Um, so I got, I got married to my lovely Nick and we had our beautiful son, Oscar. And I think it was at this point, uh, well, about three months after Oscar was born, that I realised I needed a goal again in my life. 
And you know, I, I really miss that ambition and drive that I used to feel at work. So I was invited to go along to, to a Paralympic Potential Day, um, introduced to me my, by my physio, a very, a very special, special lady, um, who, who actually, digressing a bit, but when she came to my wedding, I made sure that my, my surgeon, the lady that saved my life, the policewoman that saved my life, and my, and my physio was at my wedding. My physio said to me, she went, oh, I don't know what to get to you. I, I don't know what to get for you, for your wedding. Hey, Maggie, you're not giving me anything. You gave me a gift that no one else can give me, and that is the gift of walking. Um, but anyway, Maggie introduced me to sport, and uh, she took me along to a Paralympic Potential Day, where I pretty much tried every single sport but I fell in love with sitting volleyball. And uh, I started playing for a club in London. And then in October 2009, I was asked to try out for the first ever women's Great Britain sitting volleyball team. And as you can see, I'm at the front there. Number seven is on my shirt. Not a number because I chose it because it was David Beckham's. <laughs> no, people think that. It's like, no, I chose it because I think being involved in 7-7 seven, seven could be seen as, as very negative in my life, as well as other people's. And uh, I was, and I, I, I still am determined to make it into a posit positive. And what I love about sitting volleyball, as you might be able to see from this picture, is you don't play in a wheelchair. It's quite a liberating sport, someone that's quite reliant on a, on a wheelchair. We move constantly round on the floor on our bums. It was actually first called Bumble. <laughs> Slightly unfortunate name, I feel. Imagine that, you know, World Championships in Bumble. <laughs> I don't know why that always comes out in an American accent, so I apologise for, for, for that. Um, but thankfully, they changed it uh, to sitting volleyball. Although, because we do move constantly round on the floor on our bums, they've now adopt, we've now adopted the name floor cleaners which isn't a lot better than Bumble, but uh, they are right. By the time we've finished a match, the floor is absolutely gleaming. And uh, sport has become so important in my life, um, as well as the opportunity to obviously represent my country in a sport I love in my hometown of London. It's given me so much more on a, on a physical, emotional, and psychological level. So for instance, physically, Apart from the first time I played it, the next morning, not being able to move my arms past this point um, and having to have a bucket load of pseudo creme next to me to put on a part of my anatomy that was very sore. Um, it's got me fit again and I've discovered muscles in places that I never thought existed. Emotionally, you know, it, it gave me my confidence back and uh, it built up my self-esteem. And it, it got me out meeting a great bunch of people, people that have been through something similar to me. And psychologically, for me, this was and still is the most important thing. It gave me a dream again. It gave me a goal to work towards. And uh, I believe that it's taken me on a journey that I was always meant to make. And I have learned so much from being captain to... Um, a bunch of very strong, independent people. I was in the, the commercial world for sort of 15 years before, before I got into sport, and I thought I understood about teams. I realised I didn't know a lot at all. Um, see, the thing about us is, is, is that we were all completely different, and we still are. Different backgrounds, different cultures, just, just different walks of life. Um, and we're also a squad, a squad of very different ages, I'm not too sure whether you can see from, from this, but from, from 13 years old to 43 years old. Um, I'm obviously the, the younger end of the scale. Um, you know, one end of the scale, their priority was to download the new, you know, One Direction or Justin Bieber single before their mates at school. I don't even know whether they'd still do singles, actually. Um, or, and, and then the other end of the scale was, was balancing, you know, a highly stressful career with an ever-demanding home life and an ever-demanding training schedule. And we knew that we were going to be facing some pretty uncomfortable and very high-pressurised situations in order to embark on our journey to get to London 2012. And we realised that we were only going to get there if we stuck together, 
And if we agreed on some clear and concise values, I suppose, that we could all agree to, we all knew that we had one thing in common, and that was obviously the dream to get to London 2012. So we came up with these values uh, that we all agreed that we were going to follow. And the first one of those was respect. We needed to respect people's um, ability to make the right decisions and respect everyone's opinions. We realized that we could all learn from each other. And I believe this actually got us to the Paralympics because we learned so much. We needed to respect the position that we now found ourselves in. You know, we were representing our country in a, in a sport that we loved. The second one was trust. This was a big one. We needed to allow people to be themselves. We were all very different people. Um, and we needed trust and believe that people are doing everything they could for the good of the team, even though that might not be the same as you. The third one was commitment. That, again, before, I mean, you know, we, we, we still follow, follow these values now, but these were really important before, before getting to the Paralympics. Commitment, that we were all committed to investing as much time as we could to the team. So again, very different circumstances. I had Oscar, he was one at the time. We had people at university, at school. We had people doing 50, 60 hour weeks. So it was really trusting that everyone was doing everything they could for the good of the team. We needed to commit to being one team. We were never going to get to London if we didn't stick together as a team. And we needed to behave like a prof professional team um, and be resilient and, and stick together. Uh, so again, whether that was in training or in competition, whether that was in front of the camera or behind of the camera, we needed a commitment to stick together. The fourth one of these values was huge for us, and this was communication. We needed to listen and reflect on what was being said by who. And uh, this was a massive one for us. And, and this is what we, we adopted the sort of saying, agreed preferences. And this was all about identifying who you were talking to and how they wanted to be communicated with. So for instance, you know, I'm on court, it's match point, I serve. This doesn't usually happen, but I, do it straight in the net, you know? I don't mind one of my teammates using sarcasm, using humor, going, you know, okay, you're sacked, get off, you know, and, and using that sort of humor. But we had certain people on the team that didn't want that humor. They just wanted positive feedback. So these agreed preferences were looking at who you were talking to and how they wanted to be communicated with. So we had respect, trust, commitment, communication. And like many teams that you're in or many teams that you may lead, running across all of these values was diversity. As I said, we were all very different. And it's, it's very rare for a team to have the same sorts of people in them. And I believe it's those teams that tend to fail a lot of the time. So we realized that our differences brought a uniqueness to us, something that we would definitely build on on our journey to go to London. But obviously, we weren't there yet. We had to prove to the, to the BPA that we were good enough. <laughs> Someone here from the BPA. Uh, that we were good enough and we were strong enough uh, to get to London. And we, we had a look at our competition. So we had a look at the Americans and the Chinese and the uh, Ukrainians of this world. They've got about 12 to 16 years experience. We had two. So we realized that we weren't going to beat them on a technical level. But what we could control was our fitness. So we had to make sure that we were fitter, faster than them. And that way, we could stay in the game. We realized we couldn't do anything about the uncontrollables. But what we could control was the controllables. I'm not saying it was easy. Uh, and it still isn't easy now. We're ramping up to Rio, you know, that little competition that's next year. Um, you know, training 30 hours a week. Before, before London, we're doing about 20 at the moment, not being paid for it, and there are sacrifices or choices needed to be made. And there's a saying within the Paralympic and Olympic world, which is, I've got talent, where's my tracksuit? Well, we all know that life doesn't work like that. Um, and I don't need to tell you this within, within your, your lives and your careers. It's a balancing act. So for instance, when this photo was taken, this was our, our first ever world championships. Um, and I missed Oscar's, my son's first birthday. 
But I knew that that was a choice I had to make in order to, to pursue my dream. And as I said, you know how it is, juggling everything. Life gets hectic sometimes. And we all face those days where, and we do now, you know, training towards Rio, where you just think sometimes, I can't take anymore. I cannot do any more. And again, I'm, I'm sure you go to work and you get days where you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall. You know, on, on, on days when it, when it got really tough for me before London, I had an image of my son, Oscar, in my head. Um, and the image was a very simple image. It was Oscar holding up a banner at the Paralympics. No idea what I was going to say on it. But it was just him in the crowd holding up a banner. And, and, and that image, that simple image, really got me through those tough times where I thought I couldn't take any more. And then finally, March 2012 was the day that we got a decision of yes from the BPA. You are good enough to take up the host nation place. Huge mix of emotions, but we knew that we were edging closer and closer to our dream. But again, we'd, we'd improved so much over you know, the two years prior that we knew that our learning curve had to slow down. And our improvements were going to be a lot slower, a lot more marginal, but as important. So we realized that if we only improved 1% a day after three months, that would pretty much add up to 100%. Now, I say, I say pretty much because I, I don't know whether we've got any financial people here, nothing against accountants or anything like that. But uh, I know I'm at a healthcare conference, don't worry. Um, I was sat in front of a bunch of accountants the other day and said, 1% a day, after three months, that adds up to 100%. And all, all these hands sort of went out and went, no, no, I feel, no, that's not 100%. <laughs> you get my gist, yeah? 1% a day, after three months, that pretty much adds up to 100%. Um, so we're not talking about the big things, talking about the small things. So for me, it was, it was you know, going to the gym for one more session a week or, or getting that rest and recovery that I always used to find very hard to get. Um, you know, staying away from, from that pepperoni pizza or, or glass of, of something cheeky. All small differences, but consequences high. And then the 10th of June 2012 was the day that we'd all been waiting for. Yes, this was the day that we met Boris Johnson, which was quite a unique experience in itself. Um, no, this was the day that we found out who was selected to go to London. And I think for us, as individuals and as a team, was the hardest day we'd ever had to face. Um, you obviously had half of the team so excited, so elated that, um, you know, all their hard work had got them, you know, to their dream. They were gonna go to London. And then obviously you had the other half of the team that for them, they got the, the, uh, the decision that we were all dreading. And for them, the dream was over. So full-time training started up in the, in the glamorous Loughborough. Whoever says that life of a professional sports person isn't glamorous. Uh, we went up to Loughborough and, and the pressure was building and building and building. But we just had to keep in mind our values and um, you know, just keep, keep talking to each other. And then suddenly, and I tell you, it come around suddenly, 20th of August, we were in. We were in the Paralympic Village. And there have been so many amazing memories from that time, as I said, within this building. And I'm sure many of you have, have your own. Um, but there was, there's one memory, one night that really sticks out for me. And that was the opening ceremony um, of the Paralympics. And it really reminded me of the journey that I've been on. And it reminded me of my team me. We all have a team me, and uh, we're part of someone else's team me. My team me is made up of you know, my family and my friends and my teammates and you know, all, all the volunteers that help us do our sport and, 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 and things in life. Um, but you know, all the healthcare professionals that put me back together again and have supported me over the last 10 years. So when I was 
rolling around, in, in, not rolling around on the floor, rolling around in my wheelchair, um, in front of 80,000 people that night, going, going absolutely mad. I was doing it for me, but doing it for them as well, and uh, doing it for anyone that's been through adversity in their life and got over it. And uh, this is some of my team me here. And I remember that first came, as I said, in this building, just, just up the corridor, 31st of August. Biggest crowd we'd ever played to was about 500 people. We were now walking out into an arena, out of a tunnel, in front of 9,000 people. Huge mix of emotions, um, you know, nervousness, excitement, but proud, I felt so proud. I remember coming out of that tunnel, and I get goosebumps now thinking about it. Come out of that tunnel, and I looked over to my left, and I saw this, my team me. And look, there's my son with that banner. The, the banner, the image I had in my head, and with it saying, go, mummy, go. And I knew at that point that all the blood, sweat, and tears had all been worth it. Um, interestingly enough, the top left-hand picture, you can't actually see my dad through the size of his banner. <laughs> yeah? I had friends saying to me after the first game, we made the mistake of sitting behind your family. I was like... <laughs> I was like, what, were they really loud? They went, no, we just couldn't see anything through your dad's banner. Um, but, yeah, that will... That will that, that's a morning that will um, always, always uh, stick in my head. But we obviously had a job to do. Um, and our first game was against the Ukrainians. Number one in, in, uh, in Europe, and they're now bronze medalists. And uh, we, we did well. We actually nearly, for our first game, we nearly took the second set. But the inevitable happened. And they ramped up their technical skills. Um, they were just, they, their technical skills were just better than ours. Um, uh, but we did, we did the best we could. And, and this was pretty much what happened throughout the whole of the Paralympics. I'm not saying it was easy, it wasn't. Um, you know, we were suddenly in the highest performing sports environment. Uh, and, and we were winning sets, but we just couldn't convert them to games. But as the old saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. And we had to balance our expectation with our experience. And we just had to keep in mind what we were building towards. That was to pick up as much experience as we could at London, but to build on to be able to go off to that very small competition next year of Rio 2016. But, you know, we, we, we cannot forget the huge successes that we have done. Um, we are actually the first ever team sport. Uh, it's been done on an individual sport level before within, within the Olympics and Paralympics, but not never on a team sport level, that we've gone from a program being set up just two years before to then performing at the, at the Paralympics. That's never been done before, so that's something that we're really proud of. And obviously now, with, with, with training is, is, is ramping up. Uh, you know, we, we, we came back from the World Championships, we've got more um, competitions this year, and we're, we're ramping up for Rio, and the, and the pressure is building and building. And there have been huge amounts of change over the last um, few years. Uh, you know, funding, management, team members, and it's, it's not been easy to deal with. But like any change in life, I believe it's made it into a stronger, more focused team. And I don't think we can ignore what happened at the Paralympics within this country, within any country, what happened at the Commonwealth. Um, it had a huge impact on all of us. And I truly believe that we can use sport in our society, yes, to, to, to keep people fit, but I believe it's all about this. Um, it's all about the mind. And, and I think, you know, we can make people fitter, but we can make them more confident and also create fantastic social change. And for me, well, I believe I was always meant to make this journey. Um, there's too many connections between the 7th of July ch tube and bus bombings um, and the Paralympics and Olympics. You know, I'm sure many of you remember the 6th of July, day before, 
we were all celebrating that London had won the Olympic and Paralympic bid. Um, you know, that was the whole reason why I was late that morning on the, on the 7th of July. And I remember getting on that tube that morning before the explosions happened. And I remember picking up my paper. I remember you, you could not turn the page for something being written on the Olympics and Paralympics. And uh, I remember thinking, actually on that tube before the explosions happened, I've got to get tickets to this. I've got to get tickets. I'm a Londoner. I've got to get tickets to this. And now what I see now as a, as a journey that I was supposed to be on and maybe a part of fate, that I've actually come back from taking part. Some people say things happen for a reason, and I can only believe that that is true. People say to me, but aren't you angry with what happened? And I can truly say, no, hand on heart, I'm doing things now that I never, ever thought possible. But, ladies and gentlemen, it's people like you that have enabled me to experience this amazing journey. So please never, ever, ever underestimate the industry you all work in and all the work you do and the huge support and huge differences you make to your patients' lives. And I know that you've probably been told this before, but I don't think you're told enough. There's always, you know, so much news sometimes, you turn the TV on, you watch the paper, you get, you know, you get on the internet. And, you know, so much news about failing targets and money cutbacks. But I think people forget what healthcare is all, around, is all about. Of course, we live in a world where, where money makes the world go round. But it's not about number crunching. It's not about head counts. It's about people like you and the relationships you build with your patients. In, in the I word, I call it the I word, inspiration. I feel like that's bandied, bandied about a lot. Um, and I believe it's not about people like me. It's, it's about people like you. So I want you to look around the room, ladies and gentlemen, and realize that every single one of you are the inspirations. You are the strength. You are the courage. You, you, you are, you know, you, you're people that put people like me back together again. And there is no question at all that I would not, I wouldn't be talking to you today if it weren't for people like you. You enable your patients to rebuild their lives, but also conquer new dreams. And as the lyrics that the choir sang this morning, stand by me, you've definitely stood by me, and I want to thank you for that. Life changes, doesn't it? Um, things happen in our lives, good and bad, and we need to accept these changes, and we need to adapt so we can become stronger from them. Someone once said, it's not what happens to you that makes the difference. It's what you do with what happens to you. So I believe each and every one of you does enough in, in your daily working lives. But I suppose, question to say, where does your own journey start? And what differences can you make? So make today the day you choose to be the be best you can. Make today the day that you choose to work together to achieve better patient care. And make today the day you believe Anything is possible, as long as you believe. And I'm just going to finish with a short film now that I believe, you know, illustrates that point, which is anything is possible, as long as you believe.
Thank you ever so much, ladies and gentlemen.